Okay. So I hope you had a chance to send, uh, to try that risk free rate thing that I sent yesterday. If you didn't, you can do it on the spur of the moment. But today we're actually going to take the models we talked about last session and talk about estimating the parameters for those models. And if you look, I said the price of purity is purist, and there's a reason for that. I think if you look at these models and you approach them as a purist, I'll tell you something, you will never use these models because you're going to get so caught up in getting things precise based on the theory that you'll never get the number you want. So you're going to notice that what I'm going to do is take the most pragmatic choices I can because I need a hurdle rate. That's where I'm going. And I'm going to get the hook or crook. So here's what I'd like to start off with. I'd like to start off with the three basic numbers you need to get an expected return model going. And this was the cap -app. And of course, if you have an arbitrage pricing model or a multi-factor model, you can multiply this fourfold or fivefold depending on how many factors you have. So everything I say about the cap -app applies to any other model. I need a risk-free rate. I cannot do anything in finance without having a risk-free rate. So that's what we're going to spend a big chunk of today talking about is what is the risk-free rate? How do we come up with that number? Why might it be different across different currencies? The second number I need is a risk premium. See this number inside the brackets, expected return on the market portfolio minus the risk-free rate. From this point on, I'm never going to use that expanded version. That entire number I'm going to call the equity risk premium. Again, you cannot do corporate finance and valuation without a point of view on that number. So we're going to start talking about that number. Perhaps get a big chunk of that done too. Next session, we're going to talk about the third number, which is the beta. How do you come up with the beta? So let's start with the first of those numbers, the risk-free rate. I'll give you the criterion I need, or the criteria I need for something to be risk-free. And let's put it to the test. Remember how I described a risk-free investment last session? I said, you know exactly what you're going to make with certainty. One year time horizon, one year table, you know exactly what you're going to make with certainty. For that to be true, two conditions have to be met. The first is the entity issuing that security can have no default risk, not an iota, zero default risk. Already you can see how this is going to become a little difficult to do, at least I was going to say some currencies. You could say pretty much any currency default free. So the first requirement is the entity issuing the security has to be default free. The second requirement is a little more subtle. There can be no reinvestment risk. Let me explain what I mean by this. You have a five-year cash flow. A three-month table is not risk-free if you're looking at a five-year cash flow because you know exactly what you make over the three months. The three months you've got to invest again and invest again and you don't know what rates will be then. There's reinvestment risk in a three-month table that makes it inappropriate as a risk-free rate for a five-year cash flow. So what should I use if I have a five-year dollar cash flow? What should I use as my risk-free rate? A five-year T-bond, will that do? do? If I invest in a five-year T-bond, let's say I invest $1,000 in a five-year T-bond today, do I know exactly how much money I will have at the end of five years? Well, you're saying I know what the coupon will be. But you're going to get a coupon in six months, one year. What are you going to do with that coupon? You can't let it sit around. It's got to get reinvested. And when you reinvest, what rate are you going to earn? Who knows? A five-year T-bond is not completely risk-free if you're looking at a five-year cash flow because those pesky coupons get in the way. Can I get rid of those coupons? In fact, if I take a T-bond and strip the coupons out of the T-bond, what, what am I left with? Just the face value at the end, right? $1,000, that's called a zero coupon bond. And that would be the right risk-free rate for a five-year cash flow, a five-year zero coupon default-free bond rate. We've opened a Pandora's box here. Do you see why? You're doing capital budgeting. You're doing valuation. When do your cash flows come in? In year one, in year two, in year three, in year four, in year five, year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, year ten. And if you're a purist, what should you be doing? For the one-year cash flow, you should be using the one-year zero. For the two-year cash flow, you should be using the two-year zero. You know what a pain that is going to be? For one, you can never use the present value function in Excel from this day on. You know why, right? Because in the present value function in Excel, the discount rate has to stay the same. And if your risk-free rate changes each period, it's not, it's not 
it's not rocket science, but it is a pain in the neck. And I'm always looking for ways to avoid pains in the neck. So if I can avoid it, I'd like to avoid this entire process. So I'm going to suggest a concept I stole from how banks used to be managed. They no longer are this way, 20 or 30 years ago. This is how banks used to manage interest rate risk. If you look at the assets of a bank, you have one-year assets, two-year assets, three-year assets. To manage interest rate risk, you should take each asset and match it up to a liability with exactly the same duration. So you have to go on. Asset by asset, matching up each asset. But think of how many assets are on the books of a typ typical bank. You could have 200 different assets. You'd have to have 200 different liabilities to match them up. So this is what banks used to do. They used to do what's called duration matching. Sounds fancy, right? But this is what they did. They took the weighted average duration of their assets and tried to match the weighted duration of their liabilities. And they said, it's not perfect, but it's close enough and we can move on. And it was. You see where I'm going next, right? What did I say about your valuation? You have cash flows in year one, year two, year three. The cash flows might actually be low early on, high later on. I could ask you when the weighted duration of your cash flows is, right? In other words, on average, when do your cash flows come in? You could take a 20-year project and say, hey, roughly speaking, if I weighted the cash flows, it looks like a 12-year big cash flow. You know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to find a risk-free rate with roughly the same duration, which might be a 20-year bond. And I'm going to say, look, it's not perfect. I'm not matching up each cash flow to a perfect risk-free rate, but I've matched the duration of your cash flows to the duration of your risk-free rate. I can live with this. In fact, from this point on, when I talk about risk-free rates in corporate finance, you're going to see 10-year government bond rates. You're saying, why not three months or six months? Because nothing in corporate finance is three or six months. You might think it is, but if you're running a business, you've got to think past those three or six months. So I'm going to argue that if you're doing corporate finance, the T-bill rate should never, ever, ever come into play as a risk-free rate. If you're a private equity investor with a three-month time horizon or a portfolio manager wants to do something else, that's fine. But in corporate finance and valuation, your risk-free rate has to be long-term. You think, why stop at 10? Why not at 30? There's nothing wrong with using a 30-year T-bond rate. But the 10-year bond rate is always fresher because the U.S. government issues more 10-year bonds than any other set of longer-term bonds. And the rest of the inputs I need in my calculation, risk premium, for instance, default spreads become much easier to compute with a 10-year rate. So all we need as a risk-free rate then is a 10-year default-free bond rate. That should be easy, right? So let's go currency by currency. In fact, I'll do one currency and then I'm going to take you through that, the slides that I sent yesterday. And we're going to do risk-free rates in five or six other currencies. So let's say the U.S. dollar. Today, if I asked you what the risk-free rate in the U.S. dollar is, you would say... Take the 10-year T-bond rate, and you're done, right? What's the 10-year T-bond rate right now? About 2%. Hey, this is easy. In fact, when I did this in... Uh, if, if, so when you think about, about estimating this, essentially you're looking for a long-term risk-free rate in the current. So for U.S. dollars, there's your risk-free rate. Okay. That essentially, however, assumes what about default risk in the U.S. Treasury? That implicitly or explicitly you're just telling me there is no default risk in the U.S. Treasury. And already you can see pauses coming into that statement, right? You might not have four years ago, six years ago. But when you think about using government bond rates, you're implicitly assuming that the government issuing the security is default free. And what do we use as a shortcut for backing up that statement? We can't prove to anybody that something is default-free. So what do we show? Hey, look, look, it's default-free. What do we show them? We show them the... What did we have all that angst last summer about? S&P doing what? Lowering the rating. So we show the rating. Say, look, it's a triple-A rating. Essentially, we're passing the buck. We're saying, Moody says it's triple-A. It, therefore, it must be default-free. I know it's a shortcut, but unless you want to do a serious assessment country by country, I'd suggest you go with that shortcut. So you ready? We're, this is what we're going to do. We're going to come up with risk-free rates in a bunch of currencies, some easier than others. So, so this was the page I sent you yesterday. 
And this is actually a page I pulled out of the Financial Times. So it's right, lying out there, it's free, you know, take advantage of it. I see big stacks at the end of every day, so nobody's reading it, obviously. Okay. Just take the last four pages, that's where the key stuff is. And there's a government bond table that lists out current interest rates on 10-year bonds issued by different governments. So I'm going to go down currency by currency, and I'd like you to tell me what the risk-free rate is. The U.S., we already decided, right? And it's right there, U.S., 2.02%, roughly 2%, so that's a risk-free rate. What's the risk-free rate in British pounds? 2.16%. And again, what do you need to check? The rating, and then you're going to read that new story yesterday that Moody's put out that says the U.K. might be on a credit watch. So I hope that watch lasts a really long time, at least until this project is over. Okay. So for the moment, at least, it's a very weak defense, but you're saying 2.16% is my risk-free rate in British pounds. Let's move down. What's the risk-free rate in Japanese yen? Japan is missing. All oh, right, at the bottom. 0.99%. Right? What's the risk-free rate in Swiss francs? 0.8-something percent? 0.83%. I don't know why. I, I guess I sorted by currency. 0.83%. Or let me ask you the final one. What's the risk-free rate in euros? We have lots of choices. Look how many euros. So which of those rates are you should use as your? Why Germany? What's this thing? Are you have bias against Southern Europe or something? What, what, what is, why Germany? Tell, what is it about the German 10-year bond rate that gives you the best shot of using it as your risk-free rate? What did I say? For, for rate to be risk-free, what has to be true? There can be no default risk. This is an absolutely stupid question, but humor me anyway. Why is Greece's 10-year bond rate so high? I mean, this isn't 10 years ago when you had drachmas versus Swiss francs versus French francs. These are all in euros, right? They're all 10-year bonds. They're all government bonds. What's left to control for? Difference in default risk. We're picking the German 10-year bond rate as our risk-free rate in euros. So right now, that would be 1.97%. And even that, you could argue, has some default risk in it because whenever you turn your currency over to a common, the European Central Bank, you've given up some power. You can no longer, but you can argue that it's so small with Germany that you can afford to use the 1.97%. For God's sakes, don't value a Greek company and tell me the risk-free rate is 34.73%. Greek and risk-free don't go together in the same sentence, at least for the moment, okay? It's definitely not risk-free. Now, let me stop there. I gave you five different risk-free rates, right? U.S. dollar all the way to Swiss franc from 2% all the way down to... In fact, you have the Australian dollar at 4.16%. So here's my last question on this page. We have different currencies, different risk-free rates, right? Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? In other words, why do currencies even matter in this process? Why do risk-free rates vary across currencies? What if I told you the Mexican peso risk-free rate is 7%? It can't be risk, right? Because in a sense, if it's risk-free, it can't be because one country is risky and the other is not. What's the only thing that causes currencies to even... Inflation. Inflation, that's it. Nothing else. Don't make this more complicated than it has to be. High inflation currencies will have high risk-free rates. Low inflation currencies will. That's the only reason currencies matter, because embedded in every currency is an expected inflation. And that's why it's so critical that you match up currencies when you do analysis. In other words, if your cash flows are in pesos, your risk-free rate has to be in pesos as well. If your cash flows in U.S. dollars, your risk-free rate has to be in U.S. dollars as well. So this actually is the easy half of the equation, the currencies that we just got the risk-free rates for. Because at least in these currencies, I could find a country with a AAA rating that issued bonds denominated in that currency, right? Is that going to be true for all currencies? If I ask you for a risk-free rate in rupees, what do you need to find? A AAA entity issuing rupee-denominated bonds, right? You're not going to find it. I'll save you trouble. In two-thirds of all currencies around the world, this path is not going to be open to you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about
talk a little bit about what to do. So, I mean, we can skip the next two pages because we've done this. You can see this was actually in 2009. The euro risk-free rate was still the German. But don't get too caught up in the German part of the... Of the don't assume that the German 10-year rate is always going to be risk-free. It's risk-free because it's the lowest of the rates. If tomorrow we woke up and another country was on top of the list, we would use that as a risk-free rate. In fact, um, this is in January 2012, and you can see what the odd... I mean, you can essentially see the divergence in rates across the EU as people's assessments of default risk have shifted across these countries. Okay? So now let's ask the question, what if there is a default-free entity? What if I cannot do what I did with those five currencies? Life gets a lot more difficult, right? In fact, I'll tell you what I did in 2009, and then you're going to try your hand out at four currencies right now. So in 2009, for instance, May of 2009, the Indian government had 10-year rupee-denominated bonds with an interest rate of 7%. Okay. The Brazilian 10-year RIAI denominated bond, Brazilian government issues both dollar and RIAI denominated bonds. These were the nominal RIAI denominated bonds. The rate was 11%. So I have the 10-year government bond rate in rupees and RIAI. 7% in rupees, 11% in RIAIs. Neither of those rates is risk-free. So how do you know? I really don't, but remember how we trusted the ratings to back up those other risk-free rates? I went and looked at the local currency rating. If you're not familiar with sovereign ratings, Moody's and S&P rate every country, or pretty much every country. They give each country two different ratings. One is called a local currency rating. The other is called a foreign currency rating. The foreign currency rating is the rating attached to that country when it borrows in a different currency. So if India borrowed in U.S. dollars, the foreign currency rating would come into play. The local currency rating is the rating attached to that government when it borrows in its own currency. So what would I like to see there to be able to use these two rates as risk-free? I'd like to see a AAA. That's not what I saw. In fact, in May of 2009, the rating for Brazil, I'm sorry, for, for India was BA2, the rating for Brazil was BA1. Not terrible ratings, but clearly not AAA. So what does that tell you? Some of that 7% that you see as the Indian government bond rate is because of default risk. Some of the 11% that you see as the Brazilian government bond rate is because of default risk. If we could just figure out how much is default risk, we could clean it up, right? I'll tell you the numbers I used, and then I'll, I'll take you through the process of how these numbers can be estimated. In 2009... My estimate of what the typical default spread was for a BA2 rated country was 3%. So 7% is my government bond rate. I think 3% of that is for default risk. I'm going to take the 3% out. From this point on, for the rest of the presentation, for Tata Chemicals, the risk-free rate you're going to see in Indian rupees is going to be 4%, not 7%. Now part of you is saying, but it's an Indian company. I want to punish it. This is not the place to do it. I'll give you plenty of chances down the road to take out your frustration at a company for being a Greek company, an Indian company, a Brazilian company. Don't try to do it in the risk-free rate. Similarly, looking at Brazil, the 11% that you see there is the government bond rate. 2.5% of that is for default risk. I took out the 2.5%. The risk-free rate in nominal reais is 8.5%. So essentially, I'm starting with the government bond rate, but I'm not stopping there because some of that rate is for default risk, and I need to take it out of the process. A little later, we'll talk about why it's so critical to do this, because if you don't do this, you're often going to end up double-counting or triple-counting risk in your hurdle rates and your assessment of the company. So that's one approach. If you can find a government bond rate in that currency, you can find a rating or a spread, you can clean up the rate and come up with a risk-free rate in the currency. Here's the second one. You can give up. In fact, Brazil is a good example. Until 2004, I used to go to Brazil to do valuation seminars. I tried to find a nominal RIAI risk-free rate. You think, that should be easy. Do what you did right now. Look up a 10-year Brazilian government bond denominated in RIAIs. Until 2004, the Brazilian government did not issue long-term bonds in RIAIs. They always issued those, those bonds in U.S. dollars. And that doesn't help me. So I'd look and look and look, and after about 48 hours, I'd give up. And so I cannot get a risk-free rate in this currency. I'm going to switch currencies. And I'm not alone. 
until a few years ago, and this is still true for a lot of Brazilian equity research, 80 to 90 percent of equity research in Brazil was done in U.S. dollar terms. You essentially gave up a new currency. And that's exactly what happens when you cannot get a risk-free rate. There's nothing wrong with it. You will actually get exactly the same assessment at the end if you do everything right. But that's key, is to, is to do everything right. Is you can switch currencies and go to a currency where you feel a little more comfortable. And there's a third approach that a lot of Latin American analysts used, especially during the high inflation period. Remember why currencies matter? It's because of that inflation component, right? And there were periods in the 80s and 90s where inflation in some of these countries was 100, 200, 500, 800 percent. If your inflation rate is 800 percent, what's your risk-free rate going to look like? 822 percent, 865 percent. Know what a nightmare that is? Try putting that into your Excel spreadsheet. A discount rate of 865 percent. And see what happens to your discount factors. Your numbers will have zeros kind of multiplying through as you go through. So when you have really high and unstable inflation, it becomes a pain in the neck. So a lot of analysts in Latin America chose to do their analysis in real terms. You know what real terms means? If you're doing a capital budgeting for a project, the way you assess cash flows is you look at the number of units you will sell in the future, you multiply by a constant price, essentially you assume that the price will not change because you have no inflation, you come up with real cash flows, and if those are the cash flows you're discounting, the discount rate you need to use is a real risk-free rate. Can I get a real risk-free rate? We talked about U.S. Treasuries, the 2%. Is that a real risk-free rate or a nominal risk-free rate? That's a nominal risk-free rate, right? So if you get the 2%, could you still face risk in terms of being able to cover your consumption with that 2%? What's the risk you face? If you're a, let's say you're a, you're a 75 year old, you take all your money, you put it into T-bonds, you make 2% a year. What's the biggest risk you face? If inflation goes to 10, 15, 20%, you're squeezed, right? You still get the 2%, but everything you're paying for is going. Is there a way you could protect yourself against that? What, what would you need to buy? Tips. Tips. Have you heard of, uh, these are inflation index treasuries. Right now, the rate on them is roughly 1%. You think, that's terrible. You actually don't make 1%. If you buy that bond, you get 1% plus whatever the inflation rate is for that year. So inflation is half a percent, you get 1.5%. If it's 25%, you get 1 plus 25, which is 26%. It's a real risk-free rate. So if you're doing things in real terms, that's the rate you're going to be using is a real risk free rate. Recognize though, if inflation is high and unstable, it's not going to go away. When you switch to a different currency, it's still going to find its way into your analysis through exchange rates. I mean, high and unstable inflation is like having an elephant in your living room. Whenever it moves, you will notice. I mean, you can cover it up and say, no elephant, I don't see one. But that's exactly what inflation does, is it changes, it's high and unstable, it's going to throw everything off, and no matter which currency you do the analysis in, that's going to be there. Okay. Actually, let's stop on this page, go back to the slide that I just showed you, and So here's what we're, we, I'd like you to do. You, use the technique we talked about right now, which is we're going to come up with risk-free rates. We've already come up with risk-free rates for the other currencies. We're going to try to come up with risk-free rates for five, car, five different currencies here. The, uh, the Brazilian Riai, the Indian Rupee, the Korean Won, the South African Rand, and the Chinese Renminbi. Okay? So I went and looked up these rates. I'll send you actually a link. That's, it's a great link. It lists local currency government bond rates updated every day. It's free, actually, which is unusual. So those are the rates as of yesterday, yesterday morning. So those are the rates, the 10-year government bond rates in these currencies. I've also very helpfully listed the local currency ratings for each of these countries. Again, it's easy to get. You go to Moody's, you can look up those ratings. Notice that none of these countries are AAA rated, right? So your task is laid out for you. You know that these rates are not risk-free. So what do you need to estimate? a default spread for each of these ratings, right? I'm going to show you three pages. And with each one, I'd like you to tell me whether there are clues in that page that will allow you to come up with a default spread. Okay? So here's the first page. This is actually from the FT. 
These are emerging market countries that issue dollar or euro denominated bonds. So let's pick one. Let's pick Brazil, the 2020, which is because we're looking at around a 10 year period. So there's Brazil, there's a dollar denominated bond, 2020. The interest rate on that bond right now, this is a 10 year, roughly speaking, a 10 year dollar denominated bond issued by the Brazilian government. It has a BAA2 rating, just like the local currency bond. And the interest rate on this bond is 3.24%. So run with that. If I want to come up with a default spread for a BAA2 rating, is there a clue there? First, remember that what currency is this bond in? Dollars, right? It's not a real denom it's a dollar denominated bond. What's the risk free rate in US dollars? It's 2%. We already nailed that down. What is the Brazilian government 10 year dollar denominated bond trading at? 3.24%. What's that difference attributable to? There's your default spread, 1.24%. That goes with the BAA2 rating. In this case, you got lucky. The local currency rating also happens to be BAA2. So you know what you can do, right? Go back, subtract 1.24% from the 12.55% and you will have a risk-free rate of 11.31% in nominal reals. Is there everybody clear on what I did? I found the Brazilian dollar. This works only because Brazil has dollar-denominated bonds. It could also work if you have euro-denominated bonds. For instance, Poland has euro-denominated bonds. But in that case, what would I compare the rate to, the 3.03% to? The German 10-year bond rate, which is 1.97%, I'd get a default spread for Poland. So if your country has dollar or euro denominated bonds, you can use the interest rate on the bond to extract a spread. Subtract the spread from the government bond rate, you're home free. So one of our five countries, we're, we're, we're done, right? Here's the problem. India, China, Korea, and South Africa issue only local currency bonds. You're not going to find dollar bonds. You're not going to find euro bonds. So this approach is not going to work for them. So let me try a second approach. I don't know whether you're familiar with the CDS market. The CDS market, I mean, there's a lot of myth around it. But here's what the CDS market allows you to do. Let's take Abu Dhabi. Right? Let's suppose you're buying a 10-year bond issued by the Abu Dhabi government. And you're worried about default risk. And you decide you want to insure yourself against default risk. So let's say the, the, the interest rate on the bond is 4.25%. So that's, that's good, but they might default. You could go to the CDS market and you could buy protection against default and it'll cost you 1.02% a year. So here's what would happen. You'd buy the bond, you're going to get 4.25%. You're going to pay 1.02% of that to get rid of the default risk. You've got a risk-free investment in Abu Dhabi. And you can do this in any country. So remember for Brazil, we came up with what 1.24% as the default spread based on the dollar denominated bond. Brazil actually has a CDS. And if you look at the column that matters, is the, see the December 31st column? See the 1.43%? The CDS market, the default spread estimate that you're getting for Brazil is slightly higher than what you got on the dollar denominated bond. But it's not a huge difference, 1.43%. So that's the second way I could have got a risk-free rate in REIs is take the 12.55%, which is the nominal REI, risk -free, the no nominal REI government bond rate, subtract out 1.43%, which is the spread for, the CDS spread for Brazil, and I'd have a risk-free rate in nominal REIs. So this actually worked better for me because I was able to find the default spread for China, which is 0.90%. So go back and if you look at the Chinese nominal rate at 6%, you subtract out the 0.9%, you've got a risk-free rate in renminbi of 5.1%. So you can probably do the next one. Korea's CDS spread is 1.1%. What's the risk-free rate in Korean one? 3.81% minus 1.1% is 2.71%. And South Africa's default CDS spread is 0.53%. You subtract that out from the 8.2%, you're going to come up with 7.67% as your risk-free rate in South African rand. Start with the local currency, 10-year bond rate. Estimate the default spread by either using the government bond denominated in dollars or euros or the CDS market. 
and you're going to come up with a risk-free rate in that currency. I know I've left one country out. Because India has neither dollar-denominated bonds, nor does it have a CDS. Okay. We'll come back and talk about it, but there was a question. Yes? That's, that's a good question. How do you account for, remember we talked about the U.S. and Australia and Switzerland having no default risk because they were AAA rated? If you go to the CDS market, the CDS spreads for those countries are not zero, which is what you'd expect to see if they were truly default free. There's two reasons for that. Sometimes the CDS market doesn't agree with the rating. So for instance, for the US, you saw the CDS spread for the US start to climb last year because the market said, we don't care what the ratings agencies are telling us, we think there's default risk in the US. In fact, that's what made this S&P fiasco so strange, is by the time they reacted, the CDS market had already built in a drop in the rating by a notch. The second reason is the CD, I told you by insurance in the CDS market. I was lying, because you don't get complete insurance. There is risk in the CDS market, and it comes from the fact that there's counterparty risk. You know what counterparty risk is, right? You buy insurance. It's only as good as the credit of the person who promises you the insurance. There are other markets where this is not true. There's a clearinghouse, you don't have to worry about it. But the CDS market has come. In fact, that was the reason when Lehman went down, the CDS market almost collapsed because they were a counterparty on so many CDS you know, securities that people said, hey, what happens to the market now if they default on all these securities? So those two reasons keep the spread up. And that might explain why CDS spreads are going to be about 20 to 30 basis points higher than they should be, is because you have that counterparty spread, or the counterparty risk built in. Okay. Any other questions? Now, what are we going to do about India? We don't have a dollar-denominated bond. We don't have a CDS spread. We do have a rating, though, right? So here's my third alternative, and this is an alternative I developed about five or six years ago because I ran into countries like India all the time. So what I did was I took the 60 or 70 countries for which I was able to get default spreads, and I had their ratings, right? And I created a lookup table in Excel. Basically what this table is, you tell me the rating for your country based on other countries for which I can look up, look up default spreads. I'll tell you what the default spread for your country should be. So you ready? What's India's rating? I'll show you the rating if, you're, if you've forgotten. It's BAA3, right? Based on my lookup table, what's the typical default spread for a BAA3 rated country? Well, it's 200 basis points or 2%. So we're ready. Let me go back and show you the risk-free rate or the 10-year the, the, the rupee denominated bond rate in India is 8.89%. 2% of that is default spread. The risk-free rate in rupees now is going to be 8.89 minus 2 which is 6.89%. So save these slides because in a sense they'll give you a sense. I don't want the, this number to become a black box. You can go look this up on my website, but I don't want you to do that. I want you to be able to dig from scratch and come up with a spread because there's nothing that we're doing here that's sophisticated or difficult. There's a little number crunching. It's all out there. It's public information. We're trying to come up with risk-free rates by currency. Any questions about currency risk free rates? No? Okay. So let's talk about risk premiums. So if I, if I gave you a task, I gave you a currency, you should be able to come up with a risk free rate in that currency now, right? In fact, here's the way you can put this into practice. You've chosen your company, you've found your group. Notice how all, I've made this all in the past, so basically I'm assuming you've done that. You've done the corporate governance analysis, so all that qualitative stuff is done. Next step in the process is you have to decide what currency you're going to analyze your company in. And remember, that choice could be easy. You can say, I'm going to do it in local currency. But then if you have a Russian company, two days later you might come back and say, I've changed my mind, I'm going to do it all in euros or dollars or some other currency. Make that choice and come up with a risk-free rate in that currency. And then look across your group at different currencies. If you have two currencies, three currencies at play, and ask yourself why the risk-free rates vary, and think about what we talked about today. So let's talk about risk premiums. You know what, I'd, what we're trying to measure with the equity risk premium? We're trying to measure how much over and above the risk-free rate you would demand for investing in the average 
risk investment. Let me repeat that again. What do we say the risk-free rate right now in U.S. dollars is 2%, right? With the equity risk premium, here's the question I'm trying to answer. To get you to invest in equities as a class, how much more than 2% would I need to offer you? 3%, 5%, 7%, 9%. So let me make a couple of statements about this risk premium, and then I'm going to put you to the test to see what your risk premium is. This risk premium should be a function of what you think the average risk investment is, right? How risky you think equities are as a class. It should also be a function of how risk averse you are as an individual. What determines that? It's actually a lot of research on risk aversion. I'm going to throw some questions at you and let's see if you get the answer right. Young people versus old people. And you can have your own definition of old, right? Hey, who's more risk averse? As people age, they get more risk averse. You see, who cares? It does matter, right? The population of a country collectively ages. You should expect to see equity risk premiums climb. It's a big problem, I think, for Japan with an aging population in much of Europe. This is, and the, the U.S. without immigration, basically that's what you're going to get is an aging population. You're going to see equity risk premiums climb. This is a touchier one. Men versus, versus women. Who is more risk averse? Actually, the evidence is very interesting. Young women are more risk averse than young men. I with three boys and a girl, I can guarantee you that that's actually true. <laughs> because those boys have no idea what's coming. It's, it's, they're not risk averse because they have no idea what's coming at them. Right? This is, takes a while to grow up, I guess. Right? But as you age, the risk aversion actually converges. So by the time you get to 35 or 40, there is no significant difference between men and women. There's a third factor, which is you can't find it. You were born with a risk aversion factor that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. With my four kids, I can tell you which ones are going to be invested in bonds for the rest of their lives <laughs> and which one's going to be the option trader. My oldest still comes down the stairs holding on to the banister. I might fall now. The fixed income guy, if you ever saw one, right? <laughs> my youngest, when he was two, took off the, from the top stair expecting to be caught before he hit the bottom. <laughs> There's your option trader right there, right? Risk aversion is something you're born with. So I'll wager if I went around this room that the risk aversion inside even this room, which is a fairly homogeneous group if you think about it, right? You've all chosen a particular career path. You're at a particular point in time in your lives. I'll wager the risk aversion varies. You don't believe me? Let me put you to the test. Let's assume you have some savings. This has to be an assumption for most of you, I would guess, with the tuition we charge. Okay? And let's assume your entire savings is invested risklessly, making 5% a year. I've quit my job, and I've become a salesperson for the Vanguard 500 index fund. You know, say invest in the S&P 500. So I call you at home. I say, no, I'm, I've heard you've got all your money invested risklessly making 5%. Would you be interested in shifting your money to our index fund? Basically, what I'm asking you to do, take your money from where it is right now, earning 5% risklessly, and put it into stocks, which are riskier investments. And you being the sensible person you are, say, yes, as long as I can make a higher return. So here's what the test is. You're making 5% risklessly. What would the expected return you need to make on the Vanguard 500 index fund have to be for you to switch? Hey, don't look at your neighbor. There is no right answer. There's actually one really wrong answer. Hopefully none of you will pick it. Okay? But there's no right answer after that. Okay? So let me go down item by item. If this is your number, put up your hand. Less than 5%. You're, you're trying to get under my skin, right? Picking the wrong... If all of you had put up your hands and have said, you know what, this class is a waste of time. <laughs> you guys are beyond redemption. Let it go, right? You see why below 5% would make zero sense? If you're making 5% guaranteed, why would you settle for an expected return? Your actual return might end up being less than 5%. That's the nature of risk. But your expected return should be... So that was the one wrong answer, right? So now let's look at the potential right answers. Between 5 and 7. 
Okay, not a single person. Seven and nine. Are these the most, keep your hands up, are these the most risk averse people in the room or the least risk averse people in the room? They're the least risk averse people in the room. I'll make a prediction. They're going to go into stocks sooner than everybody else. They have a larger percentage of their portfolios in risky assets. Not, again, as I said, there's nothing good or bad. That's what risk aversion does. 9 to 11. It looks like the middle of the distribution right there. 11, 11 to 13. More than 13. You know what? You're from Russia. Where are you from? Turkey. If you look at the 11 and above, I wager a disproportionately large number of people who pick 11 and above were from emerging markets. Because your risk aversion is colored by your experience. You grow up in Venezuela, you're saying, only 13%? I need at least 30, maybe 50, maybe 80, <laughs> maybe 100, right? Because the way you think about equities reflects your experiences. But notice how different, even within this room, the risk premium. So the way you compute the risk premium is, if you told me it was not, your expected return is 9%, you've told me your risk premium is 9 minus 5, which is 4%. How is this going to help me come up with the risk premium for the market? If this were the entire market, here's how I'd compute the risk premium. I would take the numbers each of you have given me, because you've in a sense given me a risk premium, and I'd take a weighted average of those numbers. You think, weighted by what? Not by how much enthusiasm you showed when you put up your hand, but weighted by how much money you have. Let me be brutally honest with you. If you have no money, I don't care what your risk premium is. You can whisper it to me. You can yell it at me. I don't care. This is not a democracy. It's a dollar-weighted democracy. The more money you have, the more weight you bring to the table. That is why what Warren Buffett thinks about the equity risk premium matters more than what everybody in this room, this building, and the entire neighborhood thinks right now. Because that's what $40 billion brings to the table. So if this were the market, we'd be done. It'd be a weighted average. You're saying, this is easy. Let's get started. There are 55 million people in the equity market. Let's send each of them an email. Like a variation of the Nigerian email. Now I'm not asking you for money. <laughs> so just send me your risk premium and I'll take a weighted average. You'll have to send me two numbers. You'll have to send me your risk premium and tell me how much money you have. And not lie about either number. And if you could give me that, then I could take a weighted average, right? You know what the follow-up problem you're going to face is? Even after you've come up with that number, could that number change? Oh, let's try this out on you. You just gave me a risk premium. I forgot to tell you this, but while you were sitting here, Greece defaulted. The S&P 500, don't worry, nothing's happened, so don't pull out your button. So this is a hypothetical, right? <laughs> so I have to be very careful because I'm on video and say, Greece defaulted, people selling Greek bonds. Right? The S&P 500 has just dropped 20% while you were sitting here. So nothing's changed, right? You still have your money invested risklessly at 5%. And I ask you the same question. Would you switch your money now to the Vanguard 500 index fund? So here's my question. And I'd like an honest answer. You gave me a risk premium just a couple of minutes ago. I've just thrown in this one small additional fact into the mix. Market is down 20%. How many of you would now demand a larger risk premium? And, and the reason would be? Kevin? It's more risky now. Well, at least you, you got a reminder of what risk was, right? Because the reminder is, this is what risk is. How many of you demand a smaller risk premium now? And the, and the rationale would be? This is the classic contrarian view of the world, right? If stocks were good two minutes ago at whatever the price was. Now they've dropped 20%. This is like being in a store. They're having a discount right now. And I'm loading up. It's easier said than done. It's the most difficult investment strategy to put into practice. Try it out. Because what am I asking you to do? In the middle of a crisis, I want you stepping in and saying, I'm buying. Until you do that, you're a contrarian only on paper. Nine out of 10 contrarians are contrarians on paper. But that one, you know, so, but, but even with that, just one in 10, you can see risk premiums shift all the time. So here's the task we face. We've got to come up with an estimate of the risk premium. 
We can't ask everybody because there are too many people and the number keeps shifting. So here are the three ways in which you can estimate equity risk premiums. The first is to do a survey, which sounds strange because I just said you can't do that. I'm going to argue that maybe you can survey a subset of investors. And I'm going to show you four groups that have been surveyed and are consistently surveyed over time and what the risk premiums look like there. The second is to look backwards. So what do you mean look backwards? What am I trying to answer? How much will I make investing in stocks instead of T-bonds, right? I could look and tell you what they've done over the last 10 years, the last 20, the last 50. Maybe there's some information in history. That's called a historical risk premium. Oh, here would be the best choice of all. Wouldn't it be neat if I could open up the Wall Street Journal today and say, hey, you know what? The equity risk premium right now is 6.03%. A forward-looking, just like you do yields to maturity, right? Because those numbers are updated. It would be great if I could do the same thing with stocks. I think I can, but let me start with the first two approaches first. Let's start with the survey premium. As I said, no, you can't survey everybody, so you've got to survey subsets. And I've tracked four different groups here that have been surveyed over time. The first is individual investors an association called the Securities Industries Association used to survey individual investors. You say, what do you mean survey? Here's all they, they used to do. They used to go to investors and ask, what do you think stocks will do over the next year? They'd collect the answers. They'd subtract out the risk-free rate and say, this is the risk premium. They stopped doing it in 2004 because they discovered that what they were getting were not expectations, but hopes. You know what I mean by hopes? They'd ask an investor, what do you think the market will do next year? The investors say, I hope it will make 20%. And that became the expectation. So they finally said, this is useless. The second set of, the second group of investors who have been surveyed is a survey done by Merrill Lynch every year. And I'll give you the most recent update when I get, when I get it. But every year what they do is they survey institutional investors, mutual fund managers. And they ask them exactly the same question that individual investors were asked. What do you think stocks will do over the next year? Average those numbers out, subtract the risk free rate, and in 2011, that number was 3.86%. So the premium across institutional investors was 3.86%. Third group of, 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 of investors who were surveyed, are not actually investors, were CFOs. Okay? A couple of professors at Duke do the survey every year. It's a very useful survey. They ask lots of questions about how corporate finance is practiced in companies. So rather than ask portfolio manager, they're asking in companies, how do you come up with your hurdle rates? And these CFOs, at least in June of 2010, came up with a risk premium of about 3%. So that's what we're using internally. And then in the most useless survey of all, Pablo Fernandez, a good friend of mine, teaches in Spain, does a survey of academics. Here's a simple rule to take to the bank. If there's no money behind a number, ignore it. Because basically, I can throw any number out. And academics, in a sense, often are most disconnected from reality when it comes to risk premiums. And it goes back to a concept in behavioral finance called anchoring. You know what anchoring is? There's a number that gets entrenched in your mind the first time you get exposed to it. It's very difficult to shake. That becomes a number you keep coming back to. You know, when most people who teach finance at business schools got exposed to equity risk premiums, when there were PhD students, when was that? 35 years ago, 33 years ago. That number got anchored, and then it got built in. So in classrooms, I see risk premiums used that have lost all connection to reality. It's almost like you're back in the 1980s when you see these equity risk premiums. And once you put an equity risk premium into your class notes, you know what a pain it is to change? Because you do all those problems with that risk premium. If you change it, you've got to go. So basically, pr once you picked a number, you're kind of locked into it. But for better or worse, Pablo Fernandez found that you know, at least U.S. academics came up at 6%. European academics came up at 5.3%. Read into it whatever you want to read into that difference. But these are survey premiums. Having said all of this, I don't know of a single equity research analyst, corporate finance practitioner who uses survey premiums. They do these surveys, they come up with, even Merrill internally, just publishes a survey, moves on. Saying why? Because these survey premiums tend to be extremely volatile. They tend to be reactive. You know what I mean by reactive? They tend to go up after markets go up. They tend to go down after markets come down. It's almost like it's after the fact. The only market where I've seen survey premiums used is the real estate market. It's an outfit in New York called Cushman and Wakefield. 
that every year prints out basically hurdled rates for different real estate businesses by region. So let's say you were invest investing in commercial real estate in Florida. You can go to that table and tell you Florida commercial real estate, 8.3%. Basically, they surveyed developers asking, what do you demand as a rate of return when you invest in a property? It's the only business I've seen survey premiums used. But in equity markets, you almost never see survey numbers. So here's the second approach. Look backwards. Take a slice of history, ask two questions. Over this period, last 20 years, last 30 years, on average, what would I have made investing in stocks? So give me a number, 7.5%. And on average, what would I have made investing in T-bills or T-bonds? Let's say 3.5%. 7.5 minus 3.5 is 4%. That's called a historical risk premium. Sounds easy, right? First, when you use historical risk premiums, what are you implicitly assuming? that things always revert back to historical norms, right? But that's fine. That's, that, that's an assumption we make in a lot of finance, but that is the implicit assumption. And if that assumption breaks, then even if your historical risk premium is precise, it's not the number to use. Right? But here's the scary thought. Everyone out there pretty much uses historical risk premiums. They all the same book. It's actually published by a service in Chicago called Ibbots & Associates. And all Ibbotson does is it goes back. It publishes a book called Stocks, Bonds, Bills, and Inflation. Don't take it on your vacation as fun reading. All it will tell you is each year, starting in 1926, what stocks did that year, what T-bonds did that year, what T-bills did that year, the inflation rate was that year. And they report a risk premium based on that data. So everybody uses historical risk premiums. Everybody looks at that book. You'd think they'd all agree on a number, right? Every summer, as I visit these different investment banks, I try to ask people around what they're using as a risk premium in that bank then. You know what? No two investment banks seem to use the same risk premium. I, last summer, when I was around, I saw risk premiums ranging from 3% to 12%, all claiming to be historical risk premiums. So how can that be? Let me give you an answer as to why that might happen. I said historical, right? I didn't say how long in history. You could go back 10 years, you could go back 20, you could go back 50, you could go back all the way to the start of the database, which for me was 1928. Here I've taken three slices of history, different risk premiums depending on the slice of history. I've looked at the difference between stocks and T-bills, short-term governments, and stocks and T-bonds, long-term governments. The risk premium tends to be larger when you look at T-bills as opposed to T-bonds because T-bill rates have historically been lower than T-bond rates. And third, it also depends on whether I compute the premium as an arithmetic average or a geometric average. Sounds like inside statistics, right? Arithmetic average, you take 80 numbers, add them up, divide by 80. A geometric average is a compounded number. You know what the historical risk premium for the U.S. is? It's 7.55%. No, it's actually minus 3.61%. In fact, any of those numbers, the 12 numbers you see up there, ignore the numbers below. But the 12 numbers you see is technically a historical risk premium. And in the U.S., the historical risk premium, depending on what slice of history you look at, T-bills or T-bonds, arithmetic or geometric averages, can range from a negative number, minus 3.6, to a very large positive number. You're saying, this is great. No matter what I use, it's going to be somewhere in the range. I'm not going to let you cop out. It can't be that random. So I'm going to give you my priors with historical risk premiums. First, and this is going to sound... So, first, let's, let's, be, let's be consistent about our risk-free rate definition. What did I say I was going to use as my risk-free rate in corporate finance? The T-bill rate or the T-bond rate? I said T-bond, so basically all I care about is the premium over T-bond. So cross out the T-bill half... So we got rid of six numbers. That was quick. Second, go back as far as you can to come up with a risk. That sounds weird, right? I'm asking you to go back to when? 1928. That was before the Great Depression. You think, wasn't that a very different market? Absolutely. Am I worried about it? Yes. But I'd still want you to go back that far. You know why? Because each and every one of these numbers is an estimate, right? So when I take 82 years of data and say this is the risk premium, with that risk premium comes a standard error. Remember that deadly word in statistics we kind of let go right after the class? Every estimate has a standard error. And every one of these numbers has a standard error. So how big can it be? 
Let's take the, the longest history I have, which is 1928 through 2011. The risk premium I would get is, let's say, 4.1%. That sounds pretty impressive, right? Second decimal point. See this 2.36% right there? That is the standard error in my estimate. Think about it. I've told you the historical risk premium is about 4%. Then I'm saying, oh, wait, wait, before you use it, I should tell you that the standard error in that number is 2.4%, which means my true risk premium could be above 9%. It could be below 0%. And that's with 82 years of history. You think, what happens if I use 10 years of history? The risk premium is minus 3.61%. That's a scary number, right? Look at the standard error. It's 9%. So if you ask me, what's the risk premium over the last 10 years? I might as well have told you nothing. It's noise. Stock prices are so incredibly volatile that 10 years, 20 years, even 50 years of history is not enough to get an estimate that you can use in your analysis. So use T-bonds, go back as far as you can. And remember how these premiums play out. They go into your discount rates. Those discount rates get used to discount cash flows in year one, year two, year three, year five, year ten, and they compound as they go through time, right? And because they compound, the average you should be using in corporate finance should be the geometric average, not the arithmetic average. So if you kind of force me to pick a number on this table, I'm going to go back as far as I can. I'm going to go T-bonds, geometric average. The number I'd be using as my historical risk premium today, if I used one, would be 4.1%. Any questions on the historical risk premium? So I need a lot of history to get a risk, historical risk premium, right? But two of my companies are in countries where I might have trouble. I have a Brazilian company and I have an Indian company. I'm not sitting there saying, can I go back 150 years? With Brazil, I probably will have about 20 years of reliable data because pre-1992, you had you know, the REI plan, inflation. So I might have about 20 years of data. With India, again, if you go back more than 20 years, you get a very different market, a very illiquid market. So with most emerging markets, I can almost guarantee you that you're not going to have more than 20 or 30 years of data. Even with developed Europe, European markets, you have this issue, which is pre-1980s, you look at most of the European markets, they tended to be narrow, relatively few companies were listed, and relatively illiquid. So you're not getting that much data. So here's the challenge you face. A Brazilian company comes to you and says, we need a hurdle rate. You have two choices. You can say, come back in 60 years. I'll have an equity risk premium for Brazil. Or you can try to do something about it today, right? I'd strongly suggest you take the second route. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with what we know and try to estimate risk premiums for emerging markets. And we're going to do it in two steps. Here's my first step. Let's assume that I come to you with a market. Let's pick any market, Brazil. Let's assume I have a base premium I've estimated for the U.S. looking at historical data, and I feel pretty comfortable about it, 4%. The first question, if you're looking at investing in the Brazilian market, would you demand a larger premium or a smaller premium? I would say larger, right? Why? Because there's country risk there. That was the easy part. Then I'm going to ask you, how much larger? If you could come up with a measure of country risk, you'd be home free, right? Do we have one already? To get to the risk-free rate, what did I do? I start with the government bond rate and I subtracted out the default spread based on the country rating. It's going to come back into play here. In fact, this is the most common way in which investment banks come up with risk premiums for emerging markets. They have a base premium for the US by looking at EBITs and looking at the historical data, 5, 6, 4%. To that, they add the default spread for the country computed using the government bond denominated dollars, the CDS, or that lookup table. They said, we're done. That's the risk premium for the country. So if we tried this for India and Brazil, this is what the numbers would look like. The default spread, as if you remember, was 2.5% for Brazil and 3% for India. That's what we used to come up with the risk rate. I'm going to bring it back into play. The risk premium, let's say, for the U.S. was 3.88%. In May of 2009, it was 388 That's the number that's been updated to 4.1% now. So in 2009, if I were looking at Brazil and India, I had 3.88% as my risk premium for the U.S. I add 3% to that. That's Indian default spread. I come up with 6.88%. That's the risk premium for India. 
I take 2.5% added to that, 6.38%. I get a risk premium for Brazil. Is everybody clear on what we're doing? We're starting with the U.S. risk premium that we get from the historical data. We're adding the default spread to it. And we're saying we have a risk premium now for any country. So we carry this to its logical limits. If you're a AAA rated country, then you're going to be using 3.88% as your risk premium. If you're not AAA rated, you're going to be adding these additional amounts to get to the risk premium for your country. The problem, one problem I've always had with this approach is, remind me again, what is that 3% that I'm charging for India? That's to buy Indian government bonds, right? But I'm not thinking about it buying Indian government bonds. I'm going to buy Indian equities. So here's my second intuitive question. Do you think equities in India are more risky than the Indian government bond or less risky? I would expect them to be more risky. So here's the closure I'm going to bring to the process. And to do this, I'm going to look up two numbers for each country. I'm going to look up the standard deviation in the equity index in that country. So for Brazil, it's going to be the Bovespa. For India, it's going to be the Sensex. I'm also going to look up the standard deviation, the government bond issued by each country. Saying, where's this going? Hang in there. Let's take Brazil, for instance. 34% is the standard deviation in equities. 21.5% is the standard deviation in the Indian government bond. 34 divided by 21.5%. I'm dividing the standard deviation of equity by the standard deviation of the bond. Gives me about 1.5. Basically, I'm saying stocks in Brazil are about 1.5 times more risky than the bond. I'm charging a 2.5% default spread for the bond. Scaled up for the additional risk of equities, that's now going to become 3.95%. So it's one extra step. I'm taking the default spread and scaling it up to reflect the additional risk of equities. And I do the same thing for India. I look up the Sensex standard deviation. And where do you look this up? If you go to Bloomberg, you can pick any index and type in HVT, historical volatility. It'll give you a 100-day volatility. You can change that to 100 weeks. That's basically what I do. That's a number. Basically, you pull the numbers off for the indices. Use that ratio to scale up your country risk, country default spread to come up with the risk premium for that country. So that's a historical risk premium, and I'm adapting it because I don't have enough history in many markets. But I'm building off a base that I don't feel that comfortable about, because the base I'm using is that number that I got out of the historical risk premium for the US, right? 4.1%. Where I admit it, look, the standard error is huge. I really don't know whether it's 2% or 7%. So here's the third approach coming up with the equity risk premiums. I told you that if you open up the Wall Street Journal, it would be nice if you could look up the risk premium today. Right? To see what I'm going to do, let me step back and give you an, an analogy that's far simpler. Let's assume I came to you with an 8% coupon bond with a 10-year maturity. So every year you're going to get $80, $80, so let's make an annual coupon to make life simpler. At the end of the 10th year, you're going to get $1,000. And then I told you the price of the bond today was $950. So you know the price of the bond. You know the expected cash flows on the bond. And then I asked you a final question. What discount rate will make the present value of the cash flows on this bond equal to the price of the bond today? It's a trial and error. You can get there, right? There's some discount rate where the present value of $80 for the next 10 years and 1000 at the end of the 10th year will be equal to 950 In fact, when you solve for that rate, what do we call that in, in fixed income? That's the yield to maturity in the bond, right? We do this all the time in fixed income. So we take the price, we take expected cash flows, we back into the yield to maturity. Set that example to the side, because I'm going to change it a little bit. Let's assume it's the start of 2008, the year before the crisis, the year of the crisis, but the start of that year. You bought the entire S&P 500. Can you do that? Sure, you can buy spiders, you can buy indices. Start of 2008, that it will cost you 1,468.36 to buy the entire index. So instead of buying a bond, what have you bought? The 500 largest market cap stocks in the US, right? Now, instead of coupons, what do you hope and pray you will get as cash flows if you bought the 500 largest market cap stocks? Dividends, and in the US, maybe some buybacks, right? And unlike a coupon that's a fixed number, I really have no idea what those numbers would be in the future, but I can tell you what they were last year. And last year, the cash flows you'd have received from buying stocks would have been 59.03. So here's what I know. I know how much you paid, 1468.36. I know what the cash flow was last year. Final piece of the puzzle. 
I go look up what analysts are projecting as growth in earnings for the S&P 500. That's relatively easy to do in the US, numbers all over the place. And at start of 2008, they were projecting 5% growth in earnings for the S&P 500 companies for the next five years. So here's what I did. I took the cash flow from last year, 59.03, grew it at 5% next year, two years out, three years out, four years out, five years out. And each year I'm getting a little more worried about what I'm doing because these are the 500 largest market cap companies and I'm letting them grow at a rate faster than the economy, right? And that can't sustain itself. At the end of the fifth year, I closed the tap and said, no more. You'll still grow, but you'll grow now at the rate that the economy is growing at, in nominal terms. Now, this is a headache. Who knows what the nominal growth rate of the economy is? I'm going to give you a very simple proxy for the nominal growth rate of the economy. And I will set this proxy up against 100 best macroeconomists in the world because I think it actually works better. The risk-free rate at any point in time is the best proxy for the nominal growth rate in the economy. And to see why, think about it. What goes into a risk-free rate? Expected inflation plus an expected real interest rate, right? What goes into an expected nominal growth rate in the economy? Expected inflation plus an expected real growth rate. Set the two equations next to each other. Expected inflation plus expected real interest rate. Expected inflation plus expected real growth rate. In the long term, and that's what we care about here, your expected real interest rate has to converge on the expected real growth rate. Otherwise, the economy is going to come apart at the seams. Makes my life a lot easier too, right? Because after the fifth year, the growth rate I give them is the risk-free rate, 4.02%. I'm almost there. I know what you paid, 1468.36. I now have your expected cash flows for the next